Uh, let's talk about your books. Will you tell us a little bit about the Edge of Extinction series and what uh, new readers who, for some reason, have foolishly skipped it thus far can look forward to when they read it right after this? Of course. Um, so there's two books in the series. Um, the first one is The Ark Plan, and the second one is Codename Flood. And the reason there's two books is that when I originally wrote the book, it was just one book. And when I sold it to HarperCollins, they said, we like the book, but we'd like you to split it into two. So book one has a major cliffhanger ending because it's literally like halfway through my first book. And then book two continues. So basically, the Edge of Extinction series is the idea that as a human race, we figured out how to bring dinosaurs out of extinction. And it went very, very badly. Because when I got the idea, I said, you know what? If we ever bring our predators out of extinction, like our place in the food chain drops. Like that's not going to go well. So the book actually starts about 150 years after dinosaurs have kind of taken over, and they've taken over Indiana. I set the book here in Indiana, where I'm from. Um, and the main character, Sky, has been living underground with the rest of the human race. And to solve the mystery of what happened to her dad, she has to go above ground. Well, the problem is nobody survives above ground anymore. And it's kind of the adventure that happens from there. Um, and they're trying to kind of get this quest and get up to Lake Michigan. Um, and that's why book two literally takes place in Lake Michigan. Um, and I grew up near Chicago, so I grew up looking out at Lake Michigan at this huge body of water and going, there's got to be something cool, you know, that lives in there. So I grew up and I became a writer and I put some sea monsters in there. Um, so that's the Edge of Extinction series. And it's a huge really improvement over the actual Lake Michigan. I've been there and it's huge, very disappointing. You look for dinosaurs, there aren't any. You've <laughs> rocked that, right at that wrong. <laughs> I have. So it's been fun for the last years to kind of talk dinosaurs and be, I always tell kids, you know, they ask, were you like weirdly into dinosaurs before you wrote these books? And I always say, no, but I am now. Like I'm definitely the weird dinosaur lady now. So it's been interesting and also kind of scary to depart from dinosaurs and, you know, move into float, which doesn't have dinosaurs in it. I feel like I let some readers down by not putting dinosaurs in here. Um, but this book came from a lot of the stories my dad told to me as a kid growing up. Um, my dad had one of those childhoods that he probably shouldn't have survived. Like he did crazy things like light a lake on fire and try to last to a pig, which didn't go well. Um, so I always knew I wanted to do something with these stories of my dad. And I have so many like starts of books on my computer that didn't go anywhere um, because I couldn't make the stories work. I didn't know who to tell the story from. And then at the time I was, I want to say I was like a second year teacher um, and I was tutoring a student because second year teachers don't make a whole lot of money. Um, and I gave the student a prompt and I, the prompt was, what if you had a superpower and it didn't work? And so while they were doing it, I started doing the prompt too. And I came up with this character named Emerson who could float, but he couldn't control it. No, he's also afraid of heights. So he has to wear this vest. And I walked out of that tutoring session with this piece of paper and I was like, I like this. You know, I like this character, but what can I do with them? And so I literally just handed this kid Emerson my dad's entire childhood and he just happens to float. So it's kind of the, the combining of those two ideas. So you started off with without a real plot in mind. It was just, I had this character. What is the adventure for this character? And then it all yeah, kind of came from there. These characters and I said, well, give him my dad's stories. He can last to a pig and he can light a lake on fire and he can try to take a canoe across the lake and it has a hole in it. And it's not going to you know, make it all the way across. So um, it was the fastest novel by far that I've written because I had all these kind of benchmark events. Um, and then one thing that I kind of wove throughout the story was this mystery. Um, Emerson ends up in a camp called Camp Outlier with a bunch of other kids who have the same kind of issues as he has. So he can float and he can't control it. Um, there's another kid at camp who's inconsistently invisible and he can't control when he kind of blinks out of sight. There's another child who self-combusts. Um, my favorite is the kid who has x-ray vision impairment. So he has his skunk service animal. So for the person in his life, he's not on the outside. You know, he's a misfit, but when you're a misfit among misfits, nobody's a misfit anymore. Um, so for the first time, he starts making friends and having all these kind of adventures at camp. So even though they have all these kind of crazy problems, at the heart of it, it's very much a traditional camp setting that they're in at, you know, doing a lot of the same camp things. So um, they're trying to also save another camper who has a time traveling um, impairment as well. So that kind of got woven throughout the story. I wanted to ask you, your um, heroes, uh, I don't know if that's the right word. The Red Maple Boys uh, have powers that in another story or a comic book we've seen portrayed as heroic, as giving them this huge advantage. And for these kids, uh, it seems like they are, um, the, the powers are more of a disadvantage. Like for example, Emerson, uh, he can fly kind of, but he can't control it. He's forever having to be tied down, weighted down to keep him from just floating out of Earth's atmosphere. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned Murphy, the time traveler, um, who 
time travels, but not like Hermione uh, with mm -hmm. her. Oh gosh, I'm gonna show my uh, show my ignorance of Harry Potter. What is it? Time Turner. Oh, time -turner. there you go. Uh, she uh, <laughs> she has the ability to control time, but not Murphy. He he just kind of gets sucked through. He's become unstuck in time, like uh, the main character in Slaughterhouse Five. Mm -hmm. What is it that about these care or what is it that made you want to portray these powers, uh, not necessarily in a negative light, but was more of a burden for the children rather than an advantage and rather than go in the traditional route where they go on to become the X-Men and take on a villain? Right. Well, originally the, the working title I had for this book wasn't float. It was super zeros. Um, nice. And so... Um, I changed it because I didn't want them to be seen as heroes. Like, I didn't want anyone to think it was going to be the kind of book, like you said, where everybody, like, oh, they just have to figure out and train a little bit. Now they can come together and be these awesome superheroes and save the day. Um, these are kids with problems and major problems. You know, be floating, you know, Emerson is always terrified that he's going to die because of his um, floating. Like, if he doesn't have his vest on, he's just going to float up to the moon, basically. Um, and all these kids have different levels assigned to them based off of their risk of how dangerous they are to either themselves or somebody else. Um, and what I want in this book to kind of be about is how do you play the hand that you're dealt and that sometimes you're given a hand because you have the grit to play it. Um, and Emerson, that the whole thing you know, kind of goes into the book, kind of poor me, aren't I, you know, isn't it awful to be me? And he sees all these other kids with other issues. And for the first time, he goes, maybe it's not so bad. You know, maybe I am exactly who I'm supposed to be. Um, and there isn't ever a moment in the book where they all come together and save the day like superheroes because they're not. And actually, um, Gary, who's a character in the book, he's kind of surly and grumpy and um, he sticks to things. But he has a speech at the end where he says, like, we're never going to come together and be awesome, guys. Like, we're a problem. Um, and Hank says, like, don't take up motivational speaking. It's not your strong suit. <laughs> um, but I wanted it to be a book about overcoming, you know, differences and overcoming problems and kind of facing them head on. And I didn't want them to have that moment where they all have that superpower moment and, oh, it's fine, you know, because I feel like that's been done. I wanted to do something new. Did you always know, um, speaking of doing something new, something that I'm sure has to have been done in all the time travel stories, but I don't recall ever seeing it certainly not in the middle grade story. Mm -hmm. um, Murphy, slight spoiler, uh, knows that he's not going to survive the summer. He's hopped forward to times where he's not there and he's seen his parents weeping and upset. He knows that somewhere this 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 year, this summer that the book takes place, something bad is going to happen to him. Did you always know that that was going to be the case for Murphy, or did that come up while you were writing and plotting and needed conflict? Where did that come it from? It came up while I was writing. At the time, I was just writing it. It was this fun story about this kid who floats, and I was handing them all my dad's stories. Um, and then this problem with Murphy came up. And in the original draft, it didn't come up till like, over halfway through the book. Um, so one of the main editing things I had to do is I had to take his time traveling problem, which is kind of the vehicle that drives the whole plot, and I had to pull it further towards the, for, you know, towards the beginning. And I don't necessarily reveal it at the beginning, um, but there's a lot of hints that there's something going on with Murphy, that Emerson notices Murphy from the very beginning. He sees Murphy's parents crying, and he knows something's up. So I had to drop those little like breadcrumbs at the beginning so the reader would want to know what's going on with this kid. Um, and then revealed a little later. So I did pull it forward, but it is something that just kind of revealed itself. Um, I'm not someone who sits down and writes a huge detailed outline of their book. I wish I was. Um, I always call myself, you know, a pants or we fly by the seat of our pants. Um, I just start with an idea and then I just go and I see where it takes me. And if I hit a dead end, like for example, when I was writing Codename Flood, um, I hit a dead end and I sat down and I said, I think the book's done. And I was like, the last 10,000 pages, you know, 10,000 words, are kind of boring. They're kind of wandering around underground and nothing's happening. And um, so I literally took that 10,000 words and cut it and stuck it in another document so I could go back to it later if I changed my mind. And I went back to where the story was exciting and I kind of took it up another path. So um, you know those books that used to be like choose your own adventure where you get to the page and be like, if you want to go in the cave, go to page 10. If you want to go, you know, jump over the fire, go to page 30. It was kind of like that style of writing where I'd cut it off and go a different direction and see what happened. So on my computer, I have multiple documents that I call, you know, that are called float cuts. I have all these cut scenes from float where I would pull things out when they stopped working. Some of them made it back in, um, but a lot of them didn't. So with the, um, uh, I know you told me to do that with my work, and I said, oh, Laura, if only I could be as tough as you, 10,000 words gone. Oh, I know, it's um, heartbreaking. 
to give people hope who are, who are gonna follow the, the Laura Martin method of, of, of being a ninja with your writing and, and killing your mm -hmm. darlings and putting that stuff yeah, in a file saver for later. Have you had stuff that was, was in the file save forever that then you were able to use elsewhere or has been useful to you for some of the project? Actually, yeah, in the, my newest project, which you've had the, the joy of helping me edit, um, Hoax for Hire is the title. Um, oh, good, we can't talk about it. I didn't know if it was top secret. I love Hoax for Hire. Top secret. I think it's actually on HarperCollins website with no cover yet. So it's called Hoax for Hire. Um, but there was a whole scene involving a Bigfoot hoax, Bigfoot hoax um, that I cut after our critique session. It was about 25 pages of this hoax and this flashback, and I cut the whole thing, and I put it in a separate file. And so then when my editor came back with the first round of edits for Hoax for Hire, she had all these things she wanted me to add in as far as building the background with the family and all these other things. And I was like, I have a scene that does that. Would you like to see it? So I literally just sent her this cut scene. I said, should I work this back in somewhere? And she said, yeah, work it back in somewhere. So the whole scene got to come back. So sometimes, and that's actually the first time that's happened. Um, most of the time when a scene gets cut, it stays cut, except for maybe going back and grabbing a few paragraphs. Um, but I think there's something about saving it and not just like deleting it completely that makes it feel better because you're like, oh, I can come back to it later if I want to. You know, it's not like you're deleting it and it's gone forever. Um, plus, you know, there's always the fun bonus content you can do um, for your book. So there's a whole scene in Float that I cut um, that involved the boy skinny dipping that might make it on to my website as like a fun bonus chapter if someone feels like reading it. Um, you know, I remember when I read the Twilight book, I loved going in and seeing all the extra chapters she posted on her website, I think that's fun. So a lot of times those still resurface or they resurface in other books. You can bring it back for uh, what float the unrated edition? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's definitely still a little great. Um, I did end up cutting it though, because I was like, I don't know, because the boys are gonna go, you know, anyways, it's, a, it's an interesting scene. <laughs> Uh, too bad it's gone, but hopefully you'll we'll be able to put it up as a special feature. It'll come in handy for something. Yeah, it might. It was a fun scene to write. Let's put it that way. And I wanted to, oh, what did I want to ask you? I've got a bunch of notes. Oh, I wanted to ask you about the word, but you, I didn't do an exact count, but at least 30, 40 times the word, but appears here in float. What is it about that word that you like, or is this the first time anyone's ever brought it to your attention? Uh, first time anyone's brought it to my attention, I know you, I use the word scramble too much, um, but Hank is one of the main characters in Float, and he's the one who's inconsistently invisible, but he's only invisible if he doesn't have clothes on. So basically, like, when he disappears, his clothes don't. So anytime Hank's going to be sneaky or try to do something with his invisibility, he's got to be naked to do it. So you see a lot of Hank's butt <laughs> in the book. Um, and I don't know, there's just something funny about butts. I'm sorry, Float is a pretty funny book, I think. My husband told me, he's like, you're a lot funnier when you write than in person, which is kind of like a weird compliment, but not kind of thing. Um, and I don't know, there's something about butts that's funny. And so the fact that Hank's always trying to be sneaky and try to, you know, pull these pranks and do these things, and half the time he can't manage to make his entire butt, you know, invisible, it's just, it was fun. It was fun to write. I 100% agree with you. I really just wanted to get you on record as saying that you love the word butt. Because I love I it do. too. And then there's a sure. point where the kids, you know, Hank, you know, takes out his clothes and gets invisible and goes and sneaks into the cabin to get something. And someone goes, uh, do you think he's naked all the time because of invisibility? Or do you think he just likes it? They're like, probably both. <laughs> you know, he just has no, he's a very free spirit. So it's things like that don't bother him. I think that even if I had the ability to be invisible, I'm such a prude, I'd still just wear clothes. A total oh, waste of invisibility. Same here. It's fun to live vicariously through your characters, though, because they can do all sorts of things that you would never think about doing. Yeah, you can live vicariously and have them do the thing you, you always wanted. Uh, speaking of which, there's another element uh, here to float by Laura Martin, available now wherever fine books are sold. Um, the uh, characters, the boys, they make uh, something called a life list, which is like a bucket list, but instead mm -hmm. of a list of things that you want to cross off before you die, they don't consider themselves to have aged just because time passes. They, pet, they age once they can write something on that list that they've done that they always wanted to do and now it's it's completed. Mm -hmm. I always loved the idea of a bucket list and in my life I've made a lot of bucket lists, but isn't there something like a little depressing about a bucket list? Like, oh, if I check all these things off of my bucket list, I guess I can just sit around and wait to die now, right? So I never liked that idea of the bucket list that it has this kind of end date on it. Um, and so in the book, Hank says, no, I have a life list. You know, it's things I'm gonna do to get the most out of life. Um, and this book kind of talks a lot about kind of seizing the day. 
Um, that's one of the first things Hank says to um, Emerson is, you know, seize the day and YOLO and all that. Um, and because, you know, we only get one life to live and one life to do all the incredible, wonderful things we're going to do in it. Um, so why are we procrastinating on anything? Um, and I actually, when I do presentations on float, now I show there's a chart and it's a 90 year life broken up by weeks and all the weeks are in little squares. And I put it up there and I show the kids and I was like, when you look at it, it looks like a lot. But then when you start to realize how much of your life you've already used, um, you realize how quickly life goes by. And especially once you have kids, I feel like I started to notice that because they grow so fast. So if you're going to do crazy, wonderful things, why would you wait to start doing crazy, wonderful things? Um, and in the book, all the boys have, you know, a problem basically, you know, Emerson floats and um, he's always in danger of floating away. And he realizes like, I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. So why am I... Why am I afraid to kind of live outside my comfort zone? So what things are on Laura's Martin, Laura Martin's list so far, and what things are you still hoping to add? It's funny. I have multiple life lists, but we have one on our fridge right now. I sat down um, with my daughter who's four, and we made one for the summer of all the things we want to try to do this summer. Um, you know, we're going to go picking strawberries and go to the pool and go get ice cream. So a lot of my life list things right now are kid-driven because I want my kids to have this awesome, amazing childhood because you only get one. You know, childhood should be magical. Um, so a lot of them are that. I mean, I have lifeless things for being an author. I'd love to be on the YHBA list. That's like on my dream list. I actually have a blog post on my um, website about how that's one of the things on my like author bucket list um, because I taught, you know, for so long. Those were the books we always like held up and voted on and did all these fun activities with. Um, so I have a lot of like different categories, I guess, of lifeless. You know, I'd love to travel someday, but right now, um, as a mom of three little kids, you know, four-year-old, a two-year-old, and an eight-month-old, um, a lot of my lifeless things have to kind of be kid-centered right now. And I think that's fine. It's the season of life that I'm in, and um, I want them to have a spectacular childhood. I'll tell you something, since we're allowed to talk about hoax for hire, uh, one of the more amusing critiques that we that we heard at our critique session, uh, knowing that you're writing at night, was that a lot of your characters are tired in various scenes, Laura. You're raising three kids all day and then you're writing at night. Like, Why are you so tired? And uh -huh. it was just such an insight for me that of just how directly your real life influences your fiction. It is. And whether you mean it to or not, and when you guys pointed it out, I was like, you're right. Everyone's always tired. Because I am. When I sit down to write, it's usually the end of the day and I'm mentally drained and exhausted. And um, like I said, I'm glad I like what I do because you know, you get done a day of kid chasing and then it's sitting down to work. Um, but coffee helps. <laughs> I didn't used to be a coffee drinker and I definitely am. Um, I've also discovered I'm very productive early in the morning. So if I wake up before everybody and I kind of get my brain awake, I can get a lot more done before the kids wake up when my brain's not as fried. Um, sometimes that backfires though, because if you start moving the little people in your house, like sense it and they'll all wake up early. So there's been like times when I wake up at five in the morning, I'm going to get all this stuff done. And then within 10 minutes, there's a kid crying on the monitor. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and I know if I just stayed in bed, everyone would have slept, you know, but they can like sense that mom is moving. <laughs> Mom's on the move. We should all be up now. So sometimes that backfires on me, but um, yeah. And I had to change that because I was like everyone in, you know, but in hoax for hire, they're doing a lot of like staying up all night to try to figure things out and kind of, so they are tired a lot. They're tired and they're hungry a lot, which I think is probably my common state of being right now is I'm tired and I'm hungry a lot of the time. <laughs> well, in all fairness, there are reasons as, as readers will discover for them to remain tired and hungry. Mm -hmm. There should have been plot reasons, but it, that, that will always stick with me is that, that criticism. Oh. Like, oh, yeah, that's what happens, says poor authors. Something happens and we think it's not working its way into our story and then boom, there it is. There it is. <laughs> Talking about the book that readers can buy right now, float available wherever fine books are sold. What uh, what's the one thing you're hoping readers are going to take away from this story? Um, I hope they take away that some of the really great adventures in life happen outside your comfort zone. Um, I actually have a stamp that I put in the front of the books when I sign them, and it says like, "Here's your comfort zone," and then like, "Here's where the really good adventures happen." Um, because a lot of times we think that if it's something that makes us uncomfortable or makes us scared, that maybe we shouldn't do it. Um, but when you start living life outside that comfort zone, it's when the really awesome stuff starts to happen to you. Um, and it takes Emerson literally the whole book to figure that out um, and kind of befriending this kid named Hank who's constantly living life outside the comfort zone and pushing Emerson to kind of grow and be and do. Um, so I think that's the one main thing. And also about um, just accepting like the hand of cards you're dealt and knowing that sometimes you're given a problem or an issue because you have the grit to, to do it, to live that life and to show others that it can be done. Such a wonderful metaphor that Emerson's a character that's just sort of floating along in life. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> it is, and it's funny because the title was almost not float. Um, I changed it from super zeros to float, and I like loved the title of float. And then my agent, and then my publisher, we were all trying to come up with a different title. So I have like pages and pages of brainstorm titles. It was going to be the red maple man. It's going to be all these other things because if you type float into Amazon you get a lot of things. <laughs> so that was one of the main reasons. It almost wasn't called Float. Um, but when I originally wrote the book, I was going to um, have a series. It wasn't just going to be a standalone. I wanted to have like the first book called Float and have it from Emerson's point of view, then have one called Stuck from Gary's point of view, and Ignite from Anthony's point of view, and you know Disappear from Hank's point of view. So I love that kind of simplicity of that title. So I hope I get to go back and write those someday, but you never know. Well, that uh, reminds me, I'm hoping to get kind of a little bit of an exclusive. What are the odds that we're going to see an Edge of Extinction 3 and get more dinos here in Indiana? That's the number one question I get asked when author is, is there another Edge of Extinction book? Right now, there's not. Um, right now, there's just the two. And I always feel like it's weird to have a two-book series because it's so little, but it's because um, it was my original book split in half is how that happened. Um, and Edge of Extinction takes off, and my publisher came back tomorrow and said, you know, we would love to see another Edge of Extinction book. I already have it in my head. Um, I would love to write another one, especially since it's such a fun world to write, you know, the world of the dinosaurs here in Indiana. Right now there's not. Right now the Edge of Extinction series is done, floats out now, but I would say Hoax for Hire is probably closer to what Edge of Extinction is than Float, um, because it's got Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, a lot of the same kind of creatures that um, are just as interesting as dinosaurs are. Where Float's kind of a departure from those creatures, <laughs> so I, I had my moment of getting a little more normal and I went back to being a little crazier. <laughs> Thank goodness. I miss the creatures. <laughs> now, now I'm looking at what my next book will be about. I'm like, when you've written about dinosaurs, you've written about kids floating, and my next one has like Bigfoot and Locust Monster, I'm like, where do you go from here? 